Okay, I'm uh, I'm John, and uh, welcome to my uh, first ever attempt at one of these top ten rundown type YouTube video things. Been inspired by a couple of excellent ones that I've seen on uh, YouTube here, including a lovely one by a young, young man called Ben Dennis Castle, who's uh, real recommended his rundown of the top ten UK extinct locomotive classes. Bit of a railway buff, so I thought I'd do a railway one myself. So, um, welcome to my top ten uh, UK railway oddities. Now, these are locomotives that were only ever one-offs. Well, I've bent the rules a bit in one case, as we'll see later. But there are locomotives that, um, for various reasons, the classes were never propagated. Some of them were experiments. Some of them were vanity projects. Some of them were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So uh, we'll give it a rundown and um, hope you like what I'm about to offer to you. Okay, at number 10, we have the Great Western Railway 4600 Class 442 Atlantic Tanks, or Tank. Following on the, on the relative success of the Great Western's more famous County Class Tanks of uh, 1903, the, uh, um, the Great Western Railway decided to build a smaller version for lighter weight suburban services running in and out of Paddington. Uh, the result was the uh, number 4600, 548 diameter wheels and uh, 200 pound Great Western Standard boilers. It worked out of Paddington and then uh, later worked out of um, Birmingham and various other parts of the Midlands before being relegated to branch line traffic. However, it was not a success. It was found that it, found that it was a not much better of a road, road rider than the county class tanks and was not a, was not an improvement over the existing uh, GWR uh, Metro 240 tank engines that it was designed to replace. By 1925, the uh, the first of the uh, Prairie tanks were taking over suburban services and branch lines. So the uh, four four so four six double O was then um, quietly towed back to Paddington, only to be cut up in 1925. Now you have the only electric locomotive on our list, which is the uh, North Eastern Railway 2 Co. 2 Class EE1, number 13. Now, uh, around about the first year of the uh, of the 20th century, the North Eastern Railway had already started to electrify certain goods lines and suburban lines around the uh, around the North East, around the Newcastle area, and Darlington and Shield and etc. So. Um, and spurred on by the success of the uh, uh, freight uh, electrification, a scheme was hatched to electrify them, their entire main line from York through to Newcastle, with the possibility of twisting the arm of the North British to con at some point in the future to continue the electrification onto Edinburgh. Work was started on this uh, in about 1912, and uh, planning was well ahead when the whole thing was shelved due to the outbreak of World War One. At the end of the First World War, planning for this uh, operation continued uh, to the extent that Vincent Raven, the uh, uh, locomotive engineer of the North Eastern Railway, built the first of the uh, locomotives for the uh, electrification scheme. This was number 13, uh, EE1. And by 1922, it was running. It was running tests over the uh, electrified lines already built around Newcastle. However, 1923 came, and the grouping, and the LNER had no stomach for uh, any electrification schemes, and uh, the project was dropped quickly. As a result, number 13 was towed back to Darlington Works, just stuck in the back of the paint shop, and promptly forgotten about. Although. It was kind of towed out on a couple of occasions for exhibitions, normally hauled by steam locomotives. It just sat there. It appeared that the uh, North Eastern LNR, although the locomotive was useless and they had, they had nowhere to run it, was uh, quite fond of um, number, number 13. It was just left. 
in nine, uh, it was renumbered ni- uh, number six triple nine in 1946, and then uh, and then he eventually passed on to British Rail ownership uh, and became uh, number two six six double O. However, BR didn't share the soft spot that the only I had for this loco, and uh, by 1930 it was officially withdrawn, and on December of that year, towed off to Wanties and Coast Scrapyard in Rotherham, and put to the torch. Number 8, Great Eastern Railway, Class A55, Holden's Decapod. Now this uh, beast of an engine was the result of a uh, political manoeuvring. In the early part of the 20th century, the Great Eastern Railway almost had a monopoly over suburban traffic uh, running from North East London into Liverpool Street Station. And when a... uh, Rival scheme to promote an electrically hauled railway was uh, promoted in the area. A ra- railway which could potentially uh, suck traffic away from the Great Eastern Railway. The Great Eastern needed to prove that its steam locomotives could accelerate just as fast as the electric trains, therefore negating the need for the rival electric line. The result was the Decapod. A huge brute of an engine. At the time, it was the biggest thing ever built. It had a 42 square foot bo- uh, fire grate, a massive 15 and a half foot long boiler, which stood nine, which, stood, which had a sensor pitch nine foot above the rails. So, 339 one inch fire tubes. It was just vast. Three massive cylinders, and uh, it, weigh- it weighed in unladen at over 80 tons. Locomotive was completed in uh, January 1903, and uh, on the 11th of that month, it made a, a test run from Stratford to Romford and back. And then it was moved to a specially uh, reserved stretch of line near Chagwell Heath for the acceleration trials. The trials conducted on Sundays when the diversion of mainline traffic wouldn't be that much of a problem, and it is recorded to have retrieved a rather respectful 55 miles an hour after running light. As for the trials themselves, to match the acceleration of the electric trains, the locomotive had to hit an acceleration rate of uh, 1.46 feet per second per second, and the initial trials were disappointing. It only hit 1.20. However, as uh, the performance increased over subsequent runs, and the target figure was reached on the 26th of April 1903, and this was done holding a, co- holding a train of 18 four-wheel coaches loaded with pig iron to represent the passengers. So after the trials, low locomotive was towed triumphantly back to Stratford Works, where it became a star of visit for the for, vi- uh, for visits of the Institute of Civil Engineers in the June that year, and a dinner was being held in its honour. The Great Eastern was then faced with the problem of what to do with the Decapod. Its massive ten-coupled chassis meant that it was not really practical for working over curves and point works in the station, especially around Liverpool Street. Its massive weight meant that nearly every bridge on the Great Eastern system would need to be uh, strengthened to accommodate it. Its minuscule water and coal capacity meant the locomotive would have trouble reaching Chingford in the, on the outer suburbs of London, let alone any longer runs on the Great Eastern system. Therefore, in, the, in, the, in May 1904, it was, it, was, it was towed back into Stratford Works, where it appeared two years later as a rather interesting-looking tender locomotive, where it ended up running coal trains between London and Cambridge. However, when its boiler needed repairs uh, in 1913, being non-standard, the opportunity was taken at that point to cut it up. Number 7, London Midland Scottish Railway 6399 Fury. Now, the Fury was a result of a, uh, a number of experiments that were taking, off, taking place across Europe on British railways as to experiment with high pressure steam. Designed by uh, Sir Henry Fowler and uh, working in conjunction with the Superheater Company, which uh, specialises in high pressure Schmitz type three stage boilers, and built in 1929 by the North British Railway Company in Glasgow. Um, it was like, this again was a, like like our previous as the Decapod was an impressive looking locomotive for its time. It, it was a th- it was a three cylinder semi compound with one high pressure cylinder dry, uh, between the frames and two low pressure cylinders on the outside. 
Now, the boiler itself was very, rather interesting, as it was a three-stage unit, basically a three-in-one boiler. A uh, sealed high-pressure, ultra-high-pressure boiler was in the middle over the firebox, which uh, ran at an incredible 1,800 PSI. This was filled with still water. That in turn heated a high pressure boiler drum running at the still very impressive 900 psi, which in turn uh, recycled its water at a standard 250 psi for the main cylinders. It rolled out of the shop in January 1930 and uh, was prepared for its first test run on the 10th of February of that year. The run was between Glasgow and Carstairs, but approaching Carstairs at the, at the end of the run, at slow speed, one of the ultra-high pressure tubes burst. The escaping steam under extremely high pressure forced most of the fire out through the firebox hold door, and uh, it, killed the, it killed Mr. Lewis Schofield of the superheater company and injured, injured two crew on the footplate. An investigation was held at the University of Sheffield, but no reason for the accident was caused. And the border was repaired, and later in the year the locomotive was, was moved to Derby to, con uh, to continue trials. The Fury itself wasn't exactly a failure. It was more than capable of matching the existing Raw Scott and Patriot locomotives for performance. Uh, however, um, it was, it was a failure in, in the extent that the theoretical benefits of high pressure steam, which would technically mean lower running costs, it wasn't exactly much that much cheaper to run than a conventional locomotive, and the uh, extra, the increased cost of building and then maintaining these high pressure compounds meant that uh, it wasn't really economically viable. The locomotive itself was rebuilt by Stanier at Crew Works in 1935. Uh, it's coming out as a basically a raw Scott fitted with an LMS number two boiler, a numbered 6170 British Legion. In this case, it was a success because. But she also provided the prototype for the rebuilt Royal Scots that was to follow in the 1940s. At number six, we have the Southern Railway Leader Class, number 36001. Okay, now I know I'm cheating on this because there were actually five leaders ordered, but it does fall as a, uni as a unique locomotive because. Well, the only one was ever actually finished and steamed, and when the pro when the project ended, the other four, in various stages of completion, were just never finished and scrapped as they were. Okay, now the uh, Southern Railway um, during the 1930s had and 20s and 30s had uh, primarily concentrated on electrification, resulting in. Um, Many of the electric lines that are still running and causing commuter chaos in the southeast of England today. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, William Bulliard took over as the chief locomotive engineer in the 1940s that um, attention was turned on modernising its locomotive fleet. The, his first locomotive was the rather successful uh, Q1 uh, 060 Goods locomotive, followed by his famous Pacifics of the Merchant Navy and West Country classes. It, the next objects on his uh, agenda was looking at something to replace the numerous M7 and older class St. locomotives that, that were nearly life expired and running suburban services out of Waterloo and other Southern Railway London termini. The result was something radical. The leader class was uh, cutting edge in so many ways. Although it looked like a diesel, it is in fact a steam locomotive with a uh, boiler and, and a tender and water tank inside, both of which were offset to one side to allow a communication uh, of the driver between the cabs at both ends. It was, it was mounted on two 060 steam bogies with uh, some revolutionary sleeve valve technology. The firebox included thermic siphons and other interesting fire, uh, heat raising uh, gizmos. Even the fireman was given his own cab, routed halfway down the locomotive with an access door on one side. And that's where the problem started. When the first locomotive first started running its uh, first trials in uh, late 1949, the first, the, the first uh, issue of complaint concerned the poor fireman. Now, Bulliard's boilers were very, very successful at raising steam. They caused a lot of fire and they got very hot and the poor fireman stuck in this little cupboard in front of this thing soon was uh, they were soon passing out with the heat and then when the locomotive was in motion normally had to travel with their head hanging out their cab door gasping for air on top of that the boiler was so hot that the fire brick lining collapsed under the extreme heat to rectify this matter 
um, iron line, an iron lining was placed inside the firebox, which subsequently melted. Not only that, but the trade unions rightly started to complain that the firemen's working conditions were far from acceptable. And not only that, if the locomotive was involved in an accident and turned over on the side the door was, they would be they would be lethal. However, the fireman wasn't the only person that was having problems. The driver, found, the driver soon found that the cab at the smoke box end was probably even hotter and more untenable to work in than the fireman's hull, which meant that um, the locomotive, after one or two runs, was just employed permanently in reverse. It had two cabs to negate, to negate the, the, the turntables, so object defeated. And the offset position of the uh, of the boiler to allow access down the side unbalanced it, giving uh, it um, giving a very wobbly ride. This was rectified by uh, packing the access corridor full of scrap metal and concrete. On top of that, there was uh, problems with the uh, le- with, with the leaky sleeve valves on the, on the on the bogey. And once again, the poor farmer used to get it when uh, filling up with water overflow used to flow straight into the fireman's cab. Overall not a perfect idea. Bullion should have retired from uh, the Southern Railway in 1948 at the uh, grouping, but Riddles had persuaded him to stay on just to uh, continue the um, leader project. However, by 1950, the, uh, the, the, fact, well, the fact that the leader was uh, probably too far ahead of its time was beginning to tell, and um, the project was cancelled, and uh, Everything was kind of whipped away and scrapped. Not a successful locomotive. Number five, Great Western Railway, number 111, the Great Bear. This locomotive was probably, uh, was part experiment, uh, to experiment with kind of large boiler technology, and also partly a a PR vanity project on behalf of the Great Western Railway. And uh, indeed, she was an impressive locomotive when she first rolled out of the shop in uh, February 1908. The Britain's first ever Pacific locomotive. Uh, by far the biggest and most powerful thing ever built for a British railway at the time. And she was definitely a boost to the Great Western Railway's, uh, say, publicity and advertising departments, soon becoming their poster girl. Look, she shared many features, mainly that of her frames and driving wheels with the and bogies with the uh, then successful Star Class 460s. Although uh, her boiler was a completely unique design, 23 feet long, uh, which was exceptionally long by both contemporary and even later standards, which was the reason, probably the reason why Churchill went for the 462 Pacific wheel arrangements anyway, to enable it to fit a wide firebox over the long boiler and the trading wheels. She entered service, but that was where the the kind of um, the publicity of having such a great locomotive tended to burst. Although she looked impressive, she was not a great any significant improvement on speed and power over the uh, existing star class. In fact, her excessive tube lengths and boiler barrel meant that she put, that she was a little bit more hu- uh, hungry on, on coal and water, and the axle boxes under the firebox tended to overheat, causing it to stick a bit. Attempts were made to improve her by adding superheaters and top feed apparatus, but the, she was never really that much of an improvement over the star class, and uh, experimentation was brought to a halt by the First World War. Um, there was another problem as well. Her large axle loading meant that she could only really run between Bristol and Paddington, although rumour has it that she did actually reach Newton Abbott and Birmingham on various occasions, but uh, she was limited to where she could run and therefore was not as, as flexible as the existing star classes. By 1924, George Jackson Churchill, her designer, had uh, handed over the reins to Mr. Collett, and um, and Charles Collett decided that uh, when the, when the Great Bear came in for its uh, regular heavy rebuild and maintenance in uh, January 20, 1924, uh, it was time to end the experiment and she was kind of uh, dismantled and parts of it were rebuilt into a new built castle class locomotive uh, kept retaining the same number 111 and called Viscount Churchill which uh, carried on carried on in use in the Great Western Railway until July 1943 53 sorry and the Great Western Railway never really looked at Pacifics again British Railways GC3 gas turbine. Now the GC3 locomotive, uh, built by Vulcan Foundry in uh, ni- between 1958 and 1961. The number GC3 refers to the fact that there were already two other gas turbine locomotives, uh, numbers uh, 18,000 18,100, running on the western region at the time. 
rolling out of, of the English Electric's uh, Vulcan foundry at Newton the Willows, it was built to demonstrate to British Railway the, uh, the, pos- the possibility of, of uh, gas turbine as a form of locomotive power. It was interesting in the fact that the uh, 460 wheel arrangement was based loosely on that of the British, British Rail Standard Class 5 steam locomotive, although the chassis was fitted with an EM27L gas turbine developing a 2,700 horsepower. Um, the chassis itself had to be strengthened to uh, compensate for the torque that's, that the gas turbines produced, and the locomotive weighed 123 tonnes and had a top speed of 90 miles an hour. It looked quite attractive in its red oxide livery and it was tested uh, initially at the Rugby Test Centre and then on the Great Central Main Line around Leicester and then on the northern section of the West Coast Main Line including several successful runs over Shat. However, um, although the locomotive wasn't exactly a failure in its own right, by 1964 the uh, British Rail had basically decided on uh, to go with uh, diesel and electric traction and uh, GT3 was uh, these surface requirements, a fact not helped by the fact that its steam locomotive type layout with locomotive and tender meant that it would still be dis- uh, dependent on turntables, uh, something which uh, the BR was seeking to scrap with the rest of steam. It was re- in 1960, late 1965, it was returned to uh, uh, the Vulcan foundry, was then uh, eventually quietly scrapped at T- uh, TW Walls in Stratford in February 1976. Ironically, having been towed there by a Class 5 steam locomotive. Number 3, British Rail number 10100, the Fell Diesel. Um, the, the planning for this locomotive uh, took place during the very last days of the London Midland Scottish with uh, Colonel Henry Fell, a uh, entrepreneur and uh, engineer, working with H. Uh, G. Ivor of the LMS to look at uh, several perceived weaknesses in using diesel mechanical power for rail traction. They wanted a locomotive that using several small engines to save weight, which meant that both the locomotive and its supporting superstructure could be lighter. Also. A, a, a locomotive of modular design where the engines could be removed and replaced with ease, thus kind of uh, saving time and expense in maintenance. The result was the rather distinctive looking Fell diesel, originally coming out with a 484, or you could call that a uh, 2D2 um, wheel arrangement. This locomotive had no fewer than uh, six small diesel engines, four used for traction and uh, the other two as uh, reserves and for generating purposes. The uh, transmission seems hideously complicated, which I'm not going to go into here, but there's a whole section on Wikipedia, you can look it up. Um, you had what you had the largest and most powerful diesel mechanical locomotive ever built in Britain. The locomotive was soon put into service, uh, based in the Manchester area, running, uh, hauling both express passenger and goods trains between uh, London and Manchester. However, she was not a success. The insistence that everything could be mechanical was probably her undoing, as, uh, you know, as the old adage says, the more moving parts, the more there is to break, and this proved that the Phil locomotive spent as much time in the shops as it did in service. And then uh, she had a tendency to catch fire. Uh, she caught fire at Manchester Victoria, which led to uh, severe damage to her. This was in 1953, and she was um, uh, towed back to uh, the works where she was rebuilt and entered the service again after a, after a massive long two year uh, rebuild only to uh, only suffer another fire in 1958 which led to her its total withdrawal a bold try but um, it did prove that, uh, that um, if you're going to have diesel traction uh, diesel, hy- diesel electric and diesel hydraulic transmission was the way to go and probably not mechanical number two Midland Railway Paget locomotive. What you're looking at is the pit is the only known photograph of the Paget locomotive, a project that was run in complete secrecy by the Midland Railway between 1908 and 1918. A locomotive that they even refused to acknowledge the existence of, and uh, its kind of exist and its existence was only released to the world after in 1923, after the grouping by the London Midland Scottish. The locomotive designer Cecil Walter Paget was the son of uh, Midland Railway Chairman George Ernest Paget, and uh, one wonders whether there was a certain ability of uh, letting uh, letting his little son play trains when um, in 1907 Cecil was uh, appointed works manager. 
at the Derby workshops. He, uh, but even then, it seems that Daddy and the Board of Directors blocked his plans and designs for the his uh, cutting-edge uh, sleeve-valve-powered uh, 262 uh, Prairie locomotive. Uh, so Cecil decided to build it out of his own pocket. Um, however, in 1908, the money was running out, and then eventually Daddy and the rest of the Midland Board stepped in to finish the project. The locomotive rolled out the shops in January 1909 and soon made steaming trials. However, there were problems. The design called for various parts to be made out of brass, iron, phosphor, bronze and other alloys, which led to kind of uh, problems with the expansion, which uh, meant that the times of locomotive either, le- either leaked like a sieve or steamed far too hard. The, uh, the rotary valves caused constant problems, as well as did leakages from the steam pipe and the sleeve valves. The experiments took for over three years. The uh, Paget locomotive uh, took to the middle and main line in the late at night under conditions of street, uh, strictest secrecy, uh, running between Manchester and London and other parts of the Midland system. However, in, in uh, 19, 1912, during a test run somewhere near Syston, the locomotive seized up solid and couldn't be moved. The result was seven hours of blockage of the middle and main line, which caused uh, all kinds of disruption. Uh, but at this point, the uh, Midland Railway Board and Daddy had had enough. The Paget locomotive was towed back to Derby and uh, stuffed at the back of a shed under a, under a seat. Now, when the First World War came, Cecil Paget went off to France to command the Royal Engineers Railway's operating department, and while he was away, it was decided to uh, liquidate his locomotive, and she was cut up. And as I said, no one knew about it until the grouping of the LM, until the grouping and the, the middle became part of the LMS in 1923, when the details of this most mysterious locomotive and the only existing photograph were released. Now I know um, that it's on these kind of things it's normally trying to give honourable mentions, um, but I'm not going to do that because uh, if this people like what I've done here, I will do a follow up with some of the ones that I've missed, like the Cali One Two Three or the uh, Duke of Gloucester, some of the more successful one offs, the Link Lickley Banker, etc. So I'm not going to do an honourable mention. I'm just going to go straight on to number one, Fowler's Ghost. In the uh, in the in the 1860s, the middle of Metro. Metropolitan Railway was beginning to open up suburban routes uh, into and across London, and uh, initially these were steam hauled. Now, as you can imagine, the problems of uh, steam locomotion in tunnels doesn't make for a very, very good conditions for either passengers or locomotive crews. So, sorry, the, the Metropolitan Railway always on the lookout for ideas, especially in the early days, to negate this problem of smoky tunnels. One of the ideas was put forward by a uh, respected an engineer at the time called John Fowler who uh, built built for the uh, Midland Metropolitan Railway a fireless 240 steam locomotive. It was running on the Great Western 7 foot broad gauge which the Metropolitan Railway also employed on some sections of its track. Interesting uh, way this locomotive works. It was effectively a standard locomotive except that it didn't have a coal fire. The idea would be that a large number of fire bricks were heated up to incandescent heat which were then loaded into the firebox which then erased steam like a normal locomotive. Good idea John. However, the locomotive was first tried out in uh, October 9, 1861 near Hamwell on the Great Western Railway. It actually succeeded in running seven and a half miles before the condensing system leaked uh, called the boiler, the boiler to run dry and the steam pressure to drop. As a result, the boiler feed pumps jammed, creating a situation where the boiler was in danger of overheating and exploding. This was compounded because normally if that happens on the steam locomotive, you open the bo- doors at the bottom of the firebox and drop the fire out. Provision for this wasn't made, with, uh, and the fireman was... Uh, uh, face the possibility of shoveling incandescent fire bricks out of a, out of a boiler da- ready to explode by hand. The fire was damped down by, uh, by judicious uses of buckets of water and uh, the explosion never happened. The locomotive was towed off to uh, the works for a, uh, for a rebuild and then, uh, and then the following year a uh, second attempt uh, to, to run her, this time on the Metropolitan Zone system between Kings Cross and Edgware Road was undertaken. This was uh, even more disastrous. Uh, not only did the uh, same same problems that had blighted her first run appear, but she had problem raising steam in the first place, and she only uh, and she only moved about half a mile before grinding to a permanent halt. 
by this time the Midland Railway had enough um, basically told John Fowler where to go and towed his locomotive to a siding at Wilston where she was kind of left to moulder she was sold to Isaac, Isaac Watt Bolton in, 19, in 1865 with the intention he was going to convert her into a standard gauge uh, Lo uh, normal standard gauge locomotive however um, his company then went bankrupt and uh, the uh, creditors eventually sold uh, the ghost to buy a peacock who disposed of it in, 19 in 1895 again the photograph you're looking at is the only one known in existence and this is probably the locomotive that's probably the most doomed to failure that's ever run on British railways uh, however don't think that um, Mr John Fowler was a complete incompetent because uh, locomotive engineering was only his uh, sort of hobby his day job was designing bridges and uh, if you ever go north of Edinburgh you cross the fourth bridge which is uh, one of his and uh, his genius uh, for bridge designing cannot be faulted it's just that his idea for experimental locomotive designs may have been a little bit crackpot Okay, um, any comments leave them below, you know what to do, and um, I'm not going to say like my channel because this is the only railway video on my channel, everything else says rock music and um, young band and uh, a few other silly little things I'll put up, but it's not really a channel as such, just my collection of videos, but if you like this one, like it, and, uh, and um, make any comments or any errors that I put in the box below, and... Um, if it goes down well, I may do another one. Maybe I'll do one on the, the kind of British Rail prototype diesels or something like that. But anyway, have a nice day, be good, and be most excellent unto one another. Bye.